Ladies and germs, welcome back to our third and final video in our Superply, Superply game table build. I am still Jordan, your host, and in this video, we will be uh, walking through how to make the leaves, both the top and the bottom, which has routed out sections for playing on, uh, a secret button to lift said leaves and you have access to the vault beneath. We will finish the electronics, putting on the lights, securing all that. We will do the rail system underneath and we will go over the accessories which go into the rail system, such as your cup holders and your trays and your whatnots and who's it's that you can put onto the side of the table. Uh, lastly, we will do a play surface to put on the plywood vault to give it a feel like a poker table using speed cloth. That was something new for me and was pretty easy to do. Very cool. So, uh, a lot to cover in this final video. I hope you enjoy it and let's get going now. We're gonna make the leaves out of one sheet of three quarter inch. So I've put it down, I've drawn a big V to keep grain direction. And I'm gonna cut it into four equal parts. Uh, the width has already been cut, but the length is slightly oversized because I'm gonna be using uh, a router bit system in between each leaf and I'm not entirely sure how much it'll take off. So I left myself a little extra space. I'm using a round nose and a bull nose bit from Infinity Tools. The idea is to make some sort of slightly interlocking joint uh, in case you spill liquid in between them, it'll hopefully prevent it from getting to the table surface quickly. There are different tongue and groove type sets you could use. I had this one, so I wanted to try it. So I did a test piece and I did the round nose first, and then I'm taking another test piece and I'm gonna do a bull nose and try to match it up and see how it works. And, you know, it's not really a lock, but again, it's just hopefully something that's easy to do to slow down any spills that might happen on the surface of the table to prevent them from falling into the vault. So then I carefully mark which of the leaves actually will receive which one of those. And the two outside leaves don't need anything on the two outside edges because those are always going to butt up against the outer parts of the table. They don't need a bull nose or a round nose. Testing as I go. Don't want to blow it and have to get another big piece for a leaf. And again, I took the time to match the grain. So I really want to keep these leaves in order so they look their best when they're assembled on top of the table. This is actually really easy to do. You just have to take the time to dial it in really precisely. I've seen some tables, professional tables, that put like a rubber gasket in that spot, which would work even better to prevent liquid. But, uh, you know, this is this is good enough. Testing. And just a tiny bit too big. And that's fine. That's why I left it over long. I wasn't sure exactly how it would play out once I actually did the router. So I just trimmed a little bit off that first panel right there on that side closest to us because it doesn't really matter. It was just a little bit to trim off. One thing we have to do is figure out how to get those up without using a screwdriver. That is not working. So we will put a small round over on all the inner edges, except obviously the sides that have the interlocking joints. Other than that, round over tops and bottoms, all the inner edges. That'll make it easier to get in and out. And we'll just need a button. But before we make that button, we get to do the fun part of making the leaves even more useful when you flip them over if you want. This is just purely drawn on shapes that I know won't be hard to route out and that could loosely hold pens, dice, cards, trays, cups, whatever. We're just kind of really guessing. It's not really based off anything in particular, but I'm making two different templates, one for one side, one for the other side. So that'll give you a choice if you're using the leaf as a holder, which side you want to use depending on your activity, game or whatever. And to make the template, just like we did before, when we were routing out the token slots for the legs, or in the beginning when we were doing the actual slots on the side of the table, I'm simply using already square shapes cut on the table saw, and then sticking them together 
uh, and there I'm using CA glue and an accelerator to do it quickly. I'm just making sure they're even, picking it up so I don't actually stick it to the leaf. I'm putting a stop on the bottom of each one. That'll prevent it, that'll, that'll keep it in place once I clamp it so they'll be all in the right spot. Same setup as the first video, I'm using a guide bushing and a spiral up cut bit, and I'm taking my time and going about three eighths down, just routing out the shapes, and I'm not worried about the offset of the guide bushing for these. Make a big mess. And look at that, pretty darn cool. I just need to sand it, and the ply even looks good underneath. I'm gonna use the same five degree tilt to make another card holding slot, which will kind of also indicate the, the end of the useful part of um, our little trays that we're making. To do this, I had to flip the fence. And then you just rotate each piece and look at that. Really cool. A lot of sanding, both sides and then they'll just need to finish. And I'm gonna put a little cork in them, you'll see that, and then they're done. Before we get to all that, let us figure out the mechanism that will help us lift it so we can actually pull the leaves on and off much simpler. Uh, I think I'm changing this in the plans to make this step before the table's fully assembled. It'll be a lot easier, I think, um, particularly to do it when the table's upside down. But as you can see, the basic idea is we're going to drill a hole straight down through the support piece, through the bottom of the vault. I'm going to put that support piece back on. And then we're just going to use a dowel. So I'm threading it through to make sure it works. No friction. Super duper. And now we're going to cut a little handle. And I'm going to kind of revise the shape a bit in the plans but I'm figuring this out as I go. And the idea is it'll just, it'll pivot uh, on a single screw. I'm using a pocket hole screw here. And I'll go screw, washer, handle, washer. And because I did this after the fact, it would be easier to do when you're putting the table together. Like I said in the plans, I had to get in there with a right angle and it was really tight. That was difficult to do. It just needs to be tight enough that it'll stay, but loose enough that it can move but I put it right towards the bottom and the pivot point is where the dowel comes through. You can see that. So the idea is if you push up from underneath, you'll be pushing the dowel up. I realized I need a stopper for it and it's so close to the edge that I needed to take a little bit of wood out of the handle. And you'll see how it fits over a screw in a second. This will make sense. And I'm gonna use some rubberized cork that I got from Rockler. It just has a sticky back to it. And I'm just putting this on because you won't be able to see the handle, but hopefully this will let you know with a tactile feeling that if you, when you touch the cork, that's the spot you push up on. So you reach under, you'll feel that something's different. You push up on that. And that's where I put a second screw as a stop. So now the handle just drops onto there and it needs a little bit of tweaking because uh, as you can see the dowel, if you're not pushing the handle tight up against it, the dowel fell down behind it. So I've worked that out in the plans to make it a little more precise, but I got it for my own and then cut the dowel off to make it flush. Now you can barely see it. And when you test, let's see how this works. Final leaf in push up on that spot and then it raises it enough that you can stick your hand under and pull it out. I was tossing around the idea of using a metal rod, but the wood dowel uh, works really well. No issues. Okay. Now we can get ready to finish the whole darn table. I wiped it. I put on a coat of sealer. And then before I put on my poly, I'm going to do a little design mark secret thing letting us know where that handle is. Uh, I found this uh, arrow and modified it, printed it out online. It's just a piece of paper and I'm using Mod Podge to glue it on there and then you put a coat over it 
and it seals it to the wood. And now we have an indicator of where to put your hand to raise the leaf without getting frustrated. Speaking of frustrating, now three coats of poly to the entire thing. All remaining surfaces, two sides of the leaves. To save time, I made some little standoffs on scrap pieces of ply, just using nails where I cut the heads off. And uh, these are actually from a, a prior project. Um, I keep these around, they're very handy. Just screw them into the table when I need them. When I'm done, unscrew them, put them back on the shelf until the next time I have to paint two sides of something. All right, now that the table is completely built and completely finished with poly, we can finish installing the electronics. So I'm gonna drill a hole in the cavity for the electronics, very close to the edge, and I'm going to pull the lights up through that from the bottom. And then I'm gonna to start to stick them underneath our little support all the way around. Taking my time, making sure that I'm pressing them on good. And I have to tell you that 16.4 feet of LED strip that I bought was the right amount. It got right up to it, very close. So I trimmed off the end, testing them out, and those are way more obnoxious than any board game needs. That's okay, part of that is because it's bouncing the glare off all that poly. We will be making a luxurious fabric surface for that instead, so it won't be so bad. Uh, now we can feed our power module back in. I am so sorry for that lighting. It was dark in the shop and that shows up much brighter than it did from my own beady little eyes. Putting the cover on to make it look nice. And this is what it looks like lying on my back, looking up at it. So there it is, stuck in. I had some space issues. I had to get a right angle and some double-sided tape to fix it in there. And then I modified the, the piece that holds it all in, the cover, to make a spot for the controls. And I had to punch it out a little bit because the plug was just too fat. So whatever, you can't see that. That way you can reach your hand under and push the controls. And I notched out a corner, so there's uh, room for the cord to come out, and I'll run that down one of the legs. And now that it's all in final position, I used a little hot glue, just a dab of it on the cord to keep it where it needs to be. For doing a rail system for accessories, a lot of people make something along these lines, and you flip it up and hook it in to a uh, certain kind of groove you make in the sides. I tried it and decided to go with a T-Track instead. It's more expensive because you have to buy some T-Track, but it's a lot simpler in execution. And the way I had already kind of decided to make the sides, there wasn't really a good way to do the other method. This all works because it mounts under the armrest portion. And I'm cutting it. You could use a hacksaw. If you don't have a rotary cutter like that and then filing down the edges. And I'm gonna glue it in, not screw it in. I'm gonna use a lot of glue. So I'm gonna scuff it all up with some sandpaper to just help give it a little uh, something for the glue to grab onto better. And I'm gonna put three or four pieces per side of the table. And I'm gonna do that with a little two-part epoxy. I'm putting short pieces in each corner. Here's a short piece right here. I'm putting it on the top and a little on the sides. And I'm going to offset it a half inch from the leg. It's tight, but we know it's gonna fit because we tested it when we made our grooves in the armrests in the first place. So I'm gonna use a scrap piece to help me persuade it in with some gentle taps. And that box is gonna keep it from going anywhere. Looks good. And here you can see the three-piece system. I used two shorter at the edges and one longer in the middle. You could put it however you want. This will give room to slide things in. And that strange looking tool is actually a roll of magnets. And since we're epoxying stuff, let's keep going. Let's epoxy uh, some magnets into all the recesses that we made for the legs. I'm putting my, those ones happen to be labeled north which makes it convenient to know to use south ones to match it, but I kind of wish that they didn't say north and that I used blank ones. Oh well. Now we will use CA glue to glue in those south ones. 
to the little recesses we made in the tokens, and uh, then they are ready to be decorated. The accessories are going to slide into the T-Track using these number 14 inch or inch and a quarter combo pan screws. You gotta pick up those. And you put two in each accessory and it works beautifully. Uh, I started by making this trial prototype of a drink holder. And I'm experimenting with um, exact placement of the screws, how high or low they need to go, what I need to change. And uh, I was pretty close the first time and I settled on these measurements. And then I'm cutting up some more three quarter. And down the line, I might make more accessories, but I'm starting with just some drink holders, uh, a couple medium trays and a couple small trays. And all of them will use the same dado. So I'm using a long piece, which I can cut up into individual parts put a dado in, and then I traced out the cup pattern after drilling a hole with a hole saw, which is essentially just rounding off the edges. I'm also cutting these notches in this long board, which becomes the world's easiest game board divider because it literally just hangs. That's all there is to it. Very simple. Put a chamfer on the bottom, call it done. Back to our accessories. Uh, for each piece to make it a little more grabbable and finished looking, I'm going to put a chamfer on the bottom, all the way around, and the top of each piece, just not the back. There's one of the larger trays, medium, medium, large, large, medium tray. And as we're chamfering, we, I tripped the power for what must be the fifth time in two days. Yeah. And when they were done, they looked like that. Pretty snazzy. And all you do to assemble is you use a back piece, same back piece for every one, just you cut it to the length of whatever piece you're attaching it to. And you put your piece into the groove, glue it in, and fire in a brad or two. Let it sit. Cup holder. Same move, dynamite. And once those were all glued, then I could put poly on them. And I made myself a little, a little hanger. Look how handy that is. And when they were all finished, I took them to the drill press because having a, a fence definitely does make it easier to batch them all out because then they're all set at the proper distance from the, from the back of the board. Where they are on the um, left and right on the width of it isn't as important, really. That's a little more random. So they're not quite centered. They're a little more towards the back, but each piece only takes two of those large screws. Just kind of made it closer to the edges. And then uh, drilled in each screw to the proper height. And I experimented a little bit to decide what that proper height was, ultimately. But you want each screw to be pretty close to the same height. There's, there's room for play, it doesn't have to be perfect. And then the final move, the final move, is to put a little more of that cork on it. And that keeps it from scooting around, and they work beautifully. There are a million ways you can personalize your tokens. Um, my family, even though I asked them to all come up with something creative, uh, somehow decided not to and had me do it. So what I wound up doing was having them pick out designs online, things that they thought were cool. And then um, I formatted them and had them printed out on a color laser printer. Inkjet doesn't work very well for this. So I had to pay like, you know, $2 to take them to a local copy shop and they look amazing. And then I just cut them out and using the same Mod Podge we used earlier, you brush some on, put on your design, and then brush a number of coats on afterwards, which acts as a sealer and kind of a poly. And when they're all done, 
it's a surprisingly easy and effective way to make it feel like where you're sitting is your spot and everyone else can buzz off. Last thing to do is to make our removable play surface. And this is a giant sheet of what is called speed cloth. I knew nothing about it beforehand, but um, poker table supply stores online or otherwise sell it. It's actually pretty cheap. So I got a big sheet in the color I like, took some hard board and sprayed spray mount all over it. Then got the family to stand around and an additional friend and slowly lowered it on after the wife had kindly ironed out any wrinkles because I'm the worst with an iron, which I know is shocking based on what you've seen me wearing before. A little nerve wracking and it proved to be no issue when you get a bunch of Franks in one room working together. That's it. You got a little bit of time before it completely dries to pull out all the wrinkles, make sure it's nice and flat. Looks great. And once that dried, I flipped it over, trimmed it to an extent, and then I put on more spray mount just on the edges, folded it, pulling as I went, and then took a long straight edge and trimmed off the excess. A, a nice thing about using the hardboard is that it's got a lot of bend to it, which makes it easy to put it into the table or take it out, which you will see momentarily because now we can bring the table in and put it in the room it needs to go, and then we'll put this in. Okay, it's in its new home. I've unscrewed these small leaf support sides. And now you can see that with the hardboard, even by myself, I can bend it enough to get it under the two long leaf support sides and because uh, it's very flexible. And then uh, I can screw the two short sides back in. And then I can put the rod for the button back in. And uh, why is it so streaky looking? That's because I vacuumed it. Yes, it turns out if you vacuum speed cloth, it works like a regular carpet and leaves streaks. So I tried to run it in the other directions and it just made it streakier. <laughs> Good one. But I also have a backup. I had prior to building the entire table ordered this double-sided neoprene mouse pad style play mat off of Etsy, uh, which is awesome. I love it, but um, you know, it costs money more than just making your own. So anyway, now I have two surfaces I can use, three because it's double-sided, but just to show there are options out there. I'm sure there's a very easy way to get streaks out of the play surface. Uh, when it's a carpet, I just have my kids roll around on it until the streaks go away. Maybe I'll do that. If you know a better way, uh, please tell me in the comments. What else can I tell you? I think that's it. I think we covered everything. If you are interested in making a table like this, uh, please download the plans. I have a link below. They will have detailed cut lists, material lists, uh, little weird bonus things like um, this guy. It's a little, uh, little token holder I whipped up uh, with a magnetic uh, lid. Lots of fun, look at that. Um, so that'll be in the plans. Accessories, everything, everything's in those plans. If you like the music, please check out my band Quasar What What, who are currently sleeping under these leaves. Thank you very much for watching. As always, I sincerely appreciate it. Consider subscribing if you haven't, and uh, I'll see you on the next build. Until then, be good, take care of yourselves. Thanks.